Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Casada here at WPTV, and we're talking today with Dr. Larry Bush. He's an infectious disease specialist and also was the principal, is the principal investigator for the two dose J and J vaccine trial and the AstraZeneca vaccine trial for COVID-19. Thank you so much, Dr. Bush, uh, for taking some time to join us this afternoon. Sure, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And we've talked extensively with you about COVID-19 antibodies. For those of you who may have missed it, um, we ran a story this morning, which we're gonna run in just a few minutes. Um, I wanna make sure everyone knows we're talking uh, strictly COVID-19 antibodies today and what they mean, what the test results would show if you got those antibodies tested. And um, we are more than happy to take your questions. We wanna know what kind of um, questions you have about the antibodies. So we'll start off by uh, running the story we aired this morning just to kind of set the scene and let people know, um, you know what we re we've reported so far. When your immune system responds to an infection, it adapts by creating specific antibodies to fight off that organism. Think of it like an army training for battle. Once you're invaded again, that arm recognizes the threat and attacks. When we vaccinate folks, they're not getting a whole virus. They're getting a protein, a part of the virus. Think of it like you're getting the jacket from the virus which you make an antibody against. Detecting COVID-19 antibodies is most commonly done through a blood test prescribed by your doctor. But Dr. Larry Bush, an infectious disease specialist and principal investigator of the two-dose J&J and AstraZeneca vaccine trials, says your army may not always be visible in these tests. And not everybody who gets a vaccine either will produce antibodies that are measurable. That doesn't mean you don't have them. Dr. Bush believes whether you've had the vaccine or natural infection, the antibody tests can either give a false sense of security or insecurity. Leanne David got vaccinated in March and tested positive for antibodies. But three and a half months later, she got sick with COVID. I think that when people hear the word mild, that it's kind of a misconception, like, oh, if you have the vaccine that your symptoms will be mild. I think people think it's like it will be a cold or like it will be no big deal. And what I have learned with my medical professionals and everybody that has been giving me guidance through this is mild just means that they will be milder than what it would have been had you not been vaccinated. Leanne says she had trouble breathing but never had to go to the hospital. She thinks because her vaccine antibodies kicked in. But there is still a lot to learn about COVID antibodies, including how long they last. What time frame, you know, on average, are people seeing that now your antibodies start to deplete in some? Well, it's been shown early on in the trials that after one dose, you get a certain level. And after you get the second dose, if it was a two dose vaccine, it got to a plateau and then it stayed and it starts to fall somewhat. Dr. Bush says it's believed that natural infection gives you the best protection for the future. But it's also unknown how long those antibodies last, which is why vaccination is still recommended for those folks. Leanne says she's still grateful she got the vaccine. What I hear a lot from people is the survival rate from COVID-19 is extremely high. And statistics might show that. But just because you lived doesn't mean you survived. And I am still dealing with lasting effects of it now. During my COVID-19 antibodies research, I found that just with the current status of the vaccine, commercial lab tests for COVID-19 antibodies have not been FDA approved. They've been given emergency information, <laughs> and many at-home test kits for antibodies haven't been studied by the FDA. Michelle Casada, WPTV News Channel 5. All right, Dr. Bush, so a lot to unpack there, um, you know, and I want to start off first with you explaining um, how antibodies work in general, right? This is not just unique to COVID-19. This is our immune system and how our immune system responds to infections, you know, viruses, germs, that kind of thing. Sure. So there, there are various parts to the immune system. The part of the immune system that we're all born with is called the innate immune system. And that means that we're born with certain things that will help fight infections that we've never been exposed to before. Because remember, people became infected well before vaccines were ever discovered or used or well before antibiotics. And most people got over most infections. That's how the human body is built. And then there's what's called the adaptive immune system. And the adaptive immune system means that once you've been exposed to an organism, we'll call a germ, whether it be a virus or a bacteria, you adapt to it by building up specific antibodies, specific other parts of your immune, your immune system aimed at that specific infection, not in general. In other words, 
You have a raincoat that protects you against all the rain, but now that's the innate immune system. And now you have a raincoat that protects you just against a certain kind of rain. So that can either be adapted by natural infection or by prevention. And the prevention is a vaccine. So the idea of the vaccine is to mimic your, your immune system, to give you that infection without actually causing disease in you so that you gear up your immune system so that if you see that organism again, you, your soldiers will go, to, go into war. Now, in the, in the immune system, when you adapt, you build up what's called B cells. B cells are the type of white blood cell that makes your antibodies. You build up T cells, the one that we really measure in HIV patients. And you also build up other type of chemicals that may be helpful. So when we look at these antibody tests, we're just looking at the B cell response. We're not measuring the T cell response. We don't know how the T cells will react if you get exposed to these viruses. We don't know how the T cells will rev up your B cell immunity once again, even though it may have slacked off. So that's why these antibody tests are not just 100% yes or no. It's much more complex than that. What I would ask most people is, you get vaccinated for many kinds of infections, your children get vaccinated. How often do you go get an antibody test to make sure your vaccine worked? It's intuitive that you think it did work. And even if you can't measure antibodies, if you get exposed to an organism again, your memory cells likely will bring back the antibodies as you need them. One thing that causes a lot of confusion uh, for people, you know, obviously we're curious about how can people who have tested positive for having antibodies for COVID-19, whether that be through natural infection or through the vaccine, still end up possibly being reinfected with the virus? Is this because we have multiple uh, variants out there? What is the reason why you may have antibodies but still experience reinfection, whether you're vaccinated or you had natural infection? Well, for COVID, it looks like the reason is because the vaccine is not 100% protected. The efficacy in the trials was not who got COVID, but who got symptomatic COVID. And I can tell you in our trial, in the Pfizer, in the Moderna trials, there are a host of people who were vaccinated, got the vaccine, but still were exposed to COVID and got infected, but they never knew it. We knew it because we had certain blood tests from them that proved that they did get infected. So the purpose of the vaccine was to prevent symptomatic infection. And if you did get infected, to prevent you from getting very ill, winding up in the hospital and dying. And it's still working for that very well. If you look at the people who are getting hospitalized right now, usually the unvaccinated. Now, in any, in any vaccine, that doesn't 100% mean that you will not become infected. Let's take the flu vaccine. Last year, the flu vaccine was felt to be 47% effective. But that doesn't mean it wasn't beneficial. It means that you did get antibodies and they may not have totally prevented you from being exposed or infected by the virus, whether it's COVID or the flu. But if you did get infected, you already had an army ready to fight it, as opposed to waiting to develop an army. So it's not an, a shut, you know, all and off procedure here. It's, it's gradation. And the other thing to keep in mind is not everybody who gets vaccinated's immune system builds up the same effective army as somebody else. You may build up an army that just has a few soldiers and somebody else has a lot of soldiers. It's not one size fits all. And we have an example of what the lab results, if you go to like a Quest or LabCorp, a commercial lab, what those lab results would show uh, for antibodies. If Scott, you can pull them up, he's behind the scenes producing for us and bringing up this stuff. So I just want, um, you know, Dr. Bush, if you can explain, um, you know, what we're looking at here, you know, what type of antibody is this and in what cases would you get a positive result? So this is an IgG, that is a type of antibody. We have antibodies called IgG, IgM, IgA. The ones we're testing for are IgG. When you vaccinate somebody, they produce an IgG antibody around two weeks after they've received their first dose that is dependable against the spike protein. That is the only antibody that the vaccine will allow you to uh, produce, the spike protein, and this is an IgG. Now, this test just tells you if you're positive or if you're negative. It doesn't tell you how high your level is. The second test, I think, that we're going to see here, and, and the other thing that you point out on the screen is that just like the vaccines are emergency use authorization, like you had said, 
So are the lab tests. These are not fully approved tests by the FDA. It's the same idea of the vaccine. They're being used under emergency use. This one right here is the same type of antibody. It's the IgG against the spike protein. But this one actually gives you a quantitation. That's what that semi-QN is, semi-quantitated. And what they told you is that the level of antibodies, and they, they don't tell you the, the exact actual what the level is, what the denominator is. The level of antibodies here is greater than 20. It could be 200, it could be 2,000. It just tells you it's greater than 20. And the presumption everybody would have is, if some is good, more must be better. And that's not necessarily the case. That's an assumption. Again, this antibody is produced by the vaccine, but it's also produced by natural infection. So natural infection and the vaccine produce IgG spike antibodies. And this person has this either because they were infected or because they were vaccinated. To prove which it is, infection or vaccinated, you have to do a test against an antibody that would only be developed if you had natural infection because that component is not in the vaccine. And I think that's the next one you're going to show here. The yeah, nuclear, we have to scroll back up on that second. Um, right, the nucleocapsid. There's a nucleocapsid, uh, SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid, I believe. Yeah, there it is. This one. So this one says IgG antibody against the nuclear capsid, negative. This is the same patient as the last thing we just looked at. Now, what's a nuclear capsid? That's another part of the virus that we build up antibodies to. But that part of the virus, that protein, is not in the vaccine. So the fact that this is negative, it means that the reason they have spike protein IgG antibodies is because they were vaccinated. If this was positive, the reason would be they have both is because they had had COVID. They were infected. So, so this represents somebody who was not infected but got vaccinated. Mr. So bring it down for our viewers. So if you got the vaccine and you haven't had a COVID-19 infection, you would not test positive for the nucleocapsid uh, antibody because that can only come through infection. Exactly right. So, you know, a lot of people are, are just wondering, you know, what does this all mean? So, you know, if I if I wanted to get my antibodies tested, um, my, my COVID-19 antibody tested, you know, do I have to specify to my doctor which test I'm looking for because I might be negative for infection but positive for vaccine antibody? If it's not necessarily recommended, but if you went to your doctor and said, I was vaccinated and I want an antibody test to see if I built up immunity, you would ask for that semi-quantitative IgG spike. You would not ask for a nuclear capsid because as we just said, the nuclear capsid antibody test does not get produced from the vaccine. Uh, Christy had a good question. She's asking me about the vaccine and your antibodies. Um, so what happens if you had natural infection? So you build up antibodies uh, from your natural infection, but now you get the vaccine. What happens to your antibodies once you get the vaccine? the level of antibody goes up. But like I said, just because you have some and somebody else has more, it doesn't mean they're more protected. That's an intuitive thing. Uh, but the level of antibody goes up. So the recommendation still is that if you've had natural infection, that 90 days after you get over your infection, you should get the full vaccine. And the reason for that is because we haven't had enough time to follow the natural infection to know how long your immunity lasts. And we also don't know after vaccination how long your immunity lasts. We know that for vaccines like measles and German measles and chicken pox, but we don't know that for COVID. We do know that for tetanus, we get boosters for tetanus every 10 years to build up your immunity. We haven't had the time to learn that on COVID yet. So the recommendation is natural infection, go get a vaccine. And, you know, doctor, you've been a principal investigator for two of the local vaccine trials that we've had here. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing in those participants? You know, um, I know that at least the Pfizer from last year, it's been more than a year now that that trial has been going on. You know, the trials that you were a part of, what are you seeing over time with these antibodies and the and the trial participants? So the trials go on for two years and, and at least for the trials I'm involved, they, they've been going on for a year. And we continue to test people on a regular basis. It gets spread out, but they come in for examinations. They tell us how they're doing and we draw their blood. And when we draw their blood, we're looking to see if they still have immunity and that is lasting. 
Now, we are seeing people who we vaccinated that we know got vaccine who are getting COVID. But I can tell you, they're all doing well and staying out of the hospital. I saw one just this morning. She got vaccinated, two vaccines. Her last one was in January. She went to a party where nobody was wearing a mask around uh, last Saturday. She said there were about 60 people there. Five days later, she started getting a sore throat, a little headache, and a little fever. She tested positive at an urgent care center. She came in today for what we call a sick patient visit. Saturday was her worst problem. She had fever, a little bit of a sore throat, and achiness. Today, she told me she felt extremely well. And the reason for that was because her vaccine worked. Her immune system went into play and did with COVID, even though she got vaccinated, but she did well. Now let's look at the opposite. Out of the people we have in the hospital now, which are dozens and dozens and dozens, really in the hundreds, I could tell you that 98% of them never got vaccinated. The people who've been vaccinated are not winding up to the hospital. Yes, there are people who do, but it is a, such a small minority. So, yes. Uh, Dr. Lee, uh, Lynn Ryan had a question. Um, if there, will the semi-quantitative tests show antibody levels after natural infection? Yes. After natural infection, the semi-quantitative will also show IgG spike. The IgG spike comes from natural infection and vaccine. The nucleocapsid only comes from natural infection. And you mentioned before, doctor, that, you know, if someone had natural infection um, or someone got the vaccine and they went and for some reason they did get an antibody test just to, just because they were curious, if they show up negative for not having antibodies for either, um, is that possible? Is that Does that happen? And, and how do you know you're still protected even though your test came back negative for antibodies? If you showed up negative for the nuclear capsid after natural infection, that would imply to me your immune system really didn't produce a good response. After natural infection, I would expect both antibody tests at least for several months to be positive. And, and that is part of the reason why we recommend the vaccine even after natural infection. For the vaccine though, if you, you said it would take at least seven to 14 days to build up those antibodies after the vaccine. If you went and got a test after those 14 days and your antibody was negative, what does that tell you? I would wait till after you got the second dose. Let's say the second dose was 28 days. I would wait a week or two after the 28 days. Now, if there was no detectable antibody, that would either mean that you produced antibody below the level of that EUA blood test recognition, not every, you know, they can only test to a certain level, or you did not produce antibodies. At that point, I would recommend a booster. Would you say that someone who had natural infection would have more protection from being reinfected than someone who was vaccinated? Yes, I think if you were reinfected uh, after you've had natural infection, you probably would build up a good response on your own. Uh, but we don't know how good that response is, and we don't know how long it will last. Once again, it would be recommended. Let's take another vaccine, the common hepatitis B vaccine. You know, everybody thinks that if you get a hepatitis B vaccine, you are provided with protection. Well, in the healthy individuals, that's around 90% produce antibodies that are protected. And in certain populations whose immune systems aren't quite as good or people who smoke, their protection is less than 90%. So it's not an all or none thing. Another question too people have, and, and I know the CDC has recommended for some time that if you had natural infection and you're thinking about getting the vaccine, you should wait the 90 days after because it's believed you'll have antibodies for at least those three months. Has there been any new data to show that you can wait longer than the 90 days or, or that your antibodies start to deplete, deplete sooner than the 90 days? No, because the only way they can collect the data are the people in the trials. And when you look at it, the people in the trials make up a very small percent of who's been vaccinated in this country. For instance, in the Pfizer trial, there were around 39,000 people, half of whom received the vaccine and half got placebo. So you're only talking around 19, 19 and a half uh, thousand people who got vaccinated. And we know how long their antibodies last because they're continued to be tested. But the 169 million Americans who've been fully vaccinated, we don't know. So the recommendation is still 90 days. Now, the CDC originally gave the 90 days, not so much because they knew how long your antibodies lasted. What be basically, it was because when they made that recommendation, the vaccines were in short supply. 
and they rather use them on the people who haven't had natural infection, who haven't been vaccinated at all. And I know recently we saw the CDC is recommending that booster shot for those immunocompromised. Um, do you foresee that in the future, the general public will also see a recommendation to get a booster shot as well? You know, I think that will occur, although the CDC says we don't have enough information. We need to follow this longer. Right now, we do have information on the immunocompromised, so we're recommending it in those. As far as the normal person, the person without an immune system problem, there's no recommendation for it yet. I suspect as time goes on, I won't be surprised. In fact, I sort of anticipate at one point in time that will happen. I just want to remind everyone, you know, we want to take your questions. Um, there has been a lot of a high interest in uh, COVID-19 antibody talk. Um, we have been hearing from more people who are asking uh, their doctors to do these tests. I know, Dr. Bush, you recommended that you don't really you don't really think there's a need for people to go out and get an antibody test more. So you, you recommend the vaccine. Um, what can you say, Dr. Bush, when it comes to the Delta variant that we're seeing out there, the Lambda variant? You know, how protective uh, can we get? with the antibodies we have so far from the vaccine or natural infection from these variants? Well, what we know so far about the Delta virus is it is more contagious and we judge contagiousness by how many people will potentially be infected from one infected person. For the original alpha COVID-19 that we were dealing with a year, year and a half ago, the estimate was every one person potentially would infect two. With the Delta, it seems to be every one may infect six to eight, so it's more contagious. As far as it being more deadly, that's not the case. It's just that more people get infected from an infected person. As far as how well are the vaccines that are currently available, the Pfizer, Moderna, and the J&J &J vaccine holding up, they're holding up against the Delta, meaning the antibodies that we produce from this vaccine still work against Delta. Uh, even in the world where they're using AstraZeneca, that vaccine is still holding up against Delta also. Jess Decker has a question. Uh, what vaccine do you recommend the most? My husband would like to get his this week. You know, it depends on the group of persons that you're looking to vaccinate. Because of the clotting issues with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, mostly in younger women, I would recommend that those folks, they get a messenger oh. RNA vaccine, either a Moderna or a Pfizer. The other type of people who are not necessarily at risk for clotting, which was the younger women group, I would recommend any of the three. Now, the original Johnson & Johnson vaccine that's available now was a one-dose vaccine. And the reason why Johnson & Johnson did a one-dose trial was they wanted to try to get a vaccine to the public sooner than later. But the two-dose trial, the one that I'm the principal investigator for right now in Palm Beach County, is still ongoing. And we may learn that the second dose of Johnson & Johnson does better than just one dose. So I would say, unless you have a real clotting issue or you're a younger woman, I would get any of the three. Uh, the messenger RNA vaccines seem to be used more often right now. We have another, qu another question from Monica. Um, she's asking, so if you still have antibodies from a year ago or even six months, do you still recommend vaccinations? I'm assuming she means antibodies from natural infection. Yes, I do, because we, we don't know how long they're going to last. Number two, we don't know exactly what level you need and you're not getting a level check. That's only in a, in a trial. And number three, it's been proven that people who get boost, uh, boosters not after natural infection or get vaccinated after natural infection have a decreased chance of reinfection. And, and even though reinfection after natural infection is rare, it does occur to a lesser degree if they've been vaccinated. Dr. Bush, we had um, you know a lot of people asking questions yesterday. I did a brief Facebook Live just talking about this story that we aired today and how we're airing another version at six o'clock with more information. And a lot of people wanted were telling me that they were able to make appointments at CVS uh, to get an antibody test. And there have been a lot of at-home kits as well that people have been ordered. What can you tell us about the credibility, the validity of those? So there are many manufacturers making it home kits. And they basically are finger stick kits that you would put on a little piece of plastic that will determine whether you have antibodies or you don't have antibodies. The problem with them is they're not as sensitive as the blood tests being used at the commercial labs, for instance, Quest or LabCorp, which are EUA approved. The overwhelming amount of those commercial tests that you can buy over the counter or wherever 
are not EUA approved. So how well they perform, meaning how sensitive they are. Sensitivity means the ability not to miss what's really there. How sensitive are they? How often do you see a false negative? And very few of them are EUA approved. There are a few that are approved, and those are probably the ones that the commercial pharmacies would be using. Uh, but they are not as sensitive as the EUA commercial test for various reasons. So if you really were in the, in, you know, the realm that you wanted to get an antibody test, I would recommend going to your physician and uh, having a regular commercial lab. Now, if those tests that you can get at the pharmacies, which are EUA approved, but are finger stick tests, test positive, I would take that as a positive test. If they test negative, I would say it may not be sensitive enough to sense that your antibodies are there. So you're more than likely to get a false negative than a false positive with those types of tests. Correct. A false positive could occur because we, we normally are infected with four types of coronaviruses that cause the common cold, and they can potentially cross-react with these antibodies. And if the test tested positive, it's possible it's positive because you were exposed to a common cold coronavirus a few years ago. Interesting. And so Peggy George had a good question too. How long after you tested positive for antibodies should you be retested? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. <laughs> because what we do know is that your B cells produce the antibody and the, and the scientific uh, knowledge is that if you got exposed to that virus again, your B cells would rev up and produce antibodies again. So in other words, if you got the vaccine and let's say out of curiosity, you got an antibody test, you showed up that you were positive for antibodies. If someone was curious to check again down the road, were three months be too short a span or six months or nine months, you know, what is the time frame that these trial participants are being tested frequently? Well, in the trial, they're being tested originally every couple of months and then it spreads out to a half a year and then to a year. Uh, and as that information comes forward, that's what's going to make the CDC decide whether boosters are recommended. As far as people just doing it, the information is there is no information to it, and they'd be working out of emotion, not out of any knowledge. Denora had a good question, too, and I think, uh, Dr. Bush, you and I had a conversation about this the other day. Um, she said, I had the Johnson and Johnson vaccine in March and traveling out of the country in a week. Should I get another shot to be safe? Are you seeing people going out and getting another shot to possibly boost antibodies? I mean, what does that do? Will, will you create any harm to your body if you get another vaccine again? Well, the feeling is you can intermingle vaccines and uh, you won't do any harm. And that's probably been the experience that's going on. On the other hand, the Johnson & Johnson one-dose vaccine is felt to be you are fully vaccinated. Therefore, it is not a recommendation to get a second vaccine or a booster until the time comes, if it does come, that normal immune system folks, the general public, is recommended to get a booster. So right now, if you had a Johnson & Johnson vaccine and you have a normal immune system, as far as you know, there's no indication to get a booster. The reason why people do it is a, is a false sense of security. They have no knowledge that that really produces any more protection for them, but it makes them feel better. And in those cases, if you do get uh, another shot of what you've already had before, you know, what is the knowledge out there about whether it would protect you against a variant? I know that a lot of these trials were conducted when we didn't have all these variants available. So the protection there is still questionable. There's no knowledge that it would be any more protective against a variant because the, the companies keep claiming that from what they're seeing, their vaccines are holding up against the variants that we know of. So you get the same protection you already got when you first got your vaccine dose. Exactly. As of now, that's the knowledge. Correct. We've had a lot of questions too. People who are, who are curious, I know we're talking about antibodies and people have been asking about uh, certain um, health conditions and what vaccine is better for them uh, if they have certain health conditions. Uh, Melissa Hoffheinz asked, uh, she has many autoimmune disorders. Uh, which vaccine would you recommend? Um, the Guillain-Barre seems to occur more with the Johnson & Johnson, and that, that's an autoimmune process. Those people, without any knowledge, I personally would recommend a messenger RNA vaccine. But remember, people who had autoimmune conditions were not in any of these trials, and that's the concern, is that we're learning in the real-world experience what the vaccines may do in people who have autoimmune uh, conditions. But that being said, it's still heavily recommended that all folks get vaccinated unless you have a known anaphylactic reaction to that vaccine, which would be hard to know because you never had this vaccine before. 
So I would say any of them, although if you're concerned about things like Guillain-Barre, not that there's any knowledge, uh, but there's been more Guillain-Barre syndrome after Johnson & Johnson than after the Pfizer or Moderna. And, and of course, you know, at the end of the day, everyone should consult with their healthcare provider that knows their history and kind of know, you know, what, what vaccine will work out better for them, depending on their medical history. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah is that something you would recommend? <laughs> um, there was another question on here, I guess more of a comment. Um, Irene said that her friend got J and J, uh, in the spring and she got COVID last week, but she's feeling better now. Uh, a week after contracting COVID. Are you seeing that the antibodies for those who have gotten the vaccine have allowed them to recover much faster, respond much faster to the virus? Oh, absolutely. The people that we've had who've come in developing COVID, we call the sick visit in the trial. We've only hospitalized one and he went home on his fourth hospital day. Uh, so clearly people who are getting COVID who had vaccine are faring much, much better than, than those who have not had a vaccine. And, and they say, and I tell them, that's your vaccine working. It's doing exactly what it was meant to do. Not 100% protecting you from becoming infected, but keeping you healthier if you do become infected. If you, um, in a case, and Sharon brings this up, it's interesting. If she was tested and it showed that she had a high number or high amount of antibodies, I guess, due to natural infection, I'm assuming that's what she means. Um, you know, would, would you get, still get a vaccine or how much longer, I think she means, would you get a vaccine after that? If you're showing that you already have a high number of antibodies, should you wait a certain amount of time before getting the vaccine? No, the recommendation is still 90 days after that infection. So if three months have gone by, I would go get the full dose of vaccine, either one Johnson & Johnson or two of the Pfizer Modernas. And Malisha is asking, I think what we can all agree is the million dollar question, how long is the vaccine good for, right? I mean, this is what we're studying still in these trials. Well, we're studying how long the immunity lasts, but we're also studying to see if we start getting variants that the vaccines do not hold up against. And if that's the case, Think of it like a yearly flu vaccine. We will get a different coronavirus vaccine, just like we get a different flu vaccine every year. That's not a bad thing. That's an advancement in science. I, I think that's a good thing to know that. Yeah, you brought up an interesting point the other day too, Dr. Bush, you know, that a lot of people were questioning, you know, why things change in, in the recommendations, why things change um, in the science. And you mentioned that it's, we're all learning this as we go along. You know, what is the sentiment in the medical community? Uh, Cause I, I imagine you get patients calling you, well, you told me this three months ago or six months ago, this was a recommendation and now it's this. Well, what I tell people, and I just got asked by a doctor coming in here right now on the way out, he said, he asked me similar questions and he said, it's also confusing. It's been, it's confusing because one and one is not two here. This is not hard fart science. We're learning, we're learning, you know, how long do these vaccines last? What are the long-term side effects of any of the vaccines? Are they gonna hold up against variants? We're learning that on a day-to-day -day basis. So when somebody gives you new information or a new recommendation, I would not look at it like they were purposely deceiving me before. They didn't know what they were talking about. They knew exactly what they were talking about when they knew what they were talking about because it was known. But right now, the science is changing on a day-to-day -day basis, which is not a negative, it's a positive. You wanna know updates like anything else. And, and just an example of that, I remember when the vaccines were first starting to become available to the general public, it was it was the recommendation not to mix the vaccines, right? If you got the one dose Pfizer, get the second dose Pfizer and vice versa Moderna. Now you're saying that people have been intermingling vaccines. And because that's been looked at in Europe, they've been doing that for a long time. They would give one dose with one and then they'd give you a second dose with the concept that different type of vaccines would help boost the immunity better. We don't really know if that's the case, but we do know it's not harmful. So that's good news because you may not get access to the same vaccine you had before as easily. So getting a different one is not necessarily harmful and it seems to be as effective. Samantha has a really good question. Uh, how can the vaccine create herd immunity if it isn't blocking transmission? Well, because it prevents infection. It still prevents infection. If you think about it, there have been 169 million Americans fully vaccinated. And to the best of our knowledge, there have only been around 160 to 175,000 breakthrough infections. So if you looked at it, what percent of the people who've been vaccinated actually became infected now, breakthrough? It's a very small percent. So it will get to herd immunity. It's just that if you do get vaccinated, you still are contagious. But there's a lot less people becoming infected who are getting vaccinated. Right now in Florida, 
the positivity rate is around 18, 19%. That means for every 100 people who get tested, around 18 or 19 are testing positive. Whereas a month ago, six weeks ago, it was below 4%. So there's an uptick. But if you ask those 19% who tested positive, had you had a vaccine, 95% of them have not had a vaccine. We have uh, another good question here um, from Linda. If someone didn't get the vaccine uh, and didn't get the virus, can they just get the first vaccine and not the second? What does that do, Dr. Bush? The first vaccine does give you some protection, but it is much less protection. And we don't know if it's even as long lasting as a second dose. So to consider somebody vaccinated, you have to have two doses of the Pfizer or Moderna or one dose of the Johnson & Johnson. Anything short of that, is not the same game. Tammy's asking, is there, there is nothing, so there is nothing that can be given to boost our own immune system? Well, nothing, I mean, obviously there are things that people are taking like vitamin C and D and zinc, which, you know, theoretically may have some immune system benefit. The problem is that's not proven in the study. That doesn't mean you should or shouldn't do it. It means, can you show me documentation that that's beneficial? And the answer is no, I can't. I can show you documentation that the vaccines are beneficial, and I can show you documentation that monoclonal antibodies, for instance, Regeneron, if you do become infected, are beneficial if you get them early on. So people are getting monoclonal antibodies, but they're not to boost your immune system. They're to provide you some, some soldiers once you become infected. And I'm glad you mentioned the monoclonal antibodies. Um, I just want to make sure there's no confusion what the difference, because I hear the word monoclonal antibody and then COVID-19 antibodies. They're two different things, right? One is a treatment, one is a natural immune response. Can you talk a little bit about that? The monoclonal antibody is an antibody produced in a laboratory that we can infuse into you to provide you with soldiers before you build up your own soldiers from natural infection. So the recommendation for Regeneron right now is that you've had COVID for less than five to seven days. You have mild to moderate symptoms, meaning you do not have to be hospitalized and you have a condition. The condition be anything from being over 60 to having a chronic medical condition like diabetes or hypertension or heart or kidney disease to being overweight. And if you do test positive for COVID and you're symptomatic and you're one of those folks, you can go to one of the various emergency rooms in Palm Beach County and get Regeneron monoclonal antibodies, which have been proven to prevent you from getting very ill and winding up in the hospital. And this is uh, a treatment that can only be given if you've had mild to moderate, like not if you are very severely ill at that point, the monoclonal antibodies will not help? Correct. Right now, the monoclonal antibodies haven't been proven in the severely to you know very ill folk who have to be admitted. So it's only people who are not being admitted, who have mild to moderate illness, who have had recent diagnosis and have an underlying condition, anything from age over 60 to a significant weight, and it's not very significant, believe it or not, or a chronic medical condition. Doctor, how can someone access that kind of treatment right now? I know the governor had just signed off on having mobile therapy around the state. Um, you know, What does someone have to do to find out where they can get this treatment? They can call any of the local hospital emergency rooms to see if they're providing it, and the majority of them are. And I think sooner than later, you're gonna be seeing it in outpatient centers and maybe even urgent care, because it's an intravenous and it's a one hour infusion and you go home. So I think it will be seen as an outpatient shortly, but right now you can call your local ER and find out even ahead of time, if it comes to the point where you would be qualified for it or your family member would need it or a friend, do they provide it? and most of the emergency rooms are doing that. I know there has been some information in the past about if you had monoclonal antibody treatment you, and you haven't had the vaccine, you can't get the vaccine for a certain period of time after monoclonal antibody infusion. But what about if you've had the vaccine, um, Sharon is asking, but get COVID, can you still get monoclonal antibodies as a treatment? Yes, you can, even if you've had the vaccine, yes, you can. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bush. I really appreciate your time. And I thank all of you who've asked uh, great questions, had great comments. You know, really the purpose of doing these is just to get people an open forum where they can ask their own questions and, and get more information. I know sometimes it's, it's hard. There's a lot of information out there on TV, on the web, you know, at your doctor's office. So uh, I'm really grateful that we were able to have you on for some time, Dr. Bush. And again, we have another story at uh, six o'clock tonight on News Channel 5 um, talking about antibodies and providing some more information. Well, thanks for asking me. I hope it was helpful. Thank you so much. Thank for you.
We appreciate you. And thank you all so much for participating. Have a great day. Bye-bye.